In this session, we will build the DCF model. We will start by setting up the structure and timeline for the DCF model. Then we will calculate the free cash flows to the firm. We will do the terminal value calculation. We will discount the free cash flows to the firm and the terminal value to their present values, and then derive the enterprise value, make some adjustments, and then we will arrive at equity value. Please open up the file DCF model blank. A link to the file will be attached in the blog post or in the notes to the video. If you can't find the file, please contact us through our contact form and we will try to send that to you. Once you have the file open, uh, you can open up all the sections so we can see what we have here. As always, we start with our assumptions that will drive the forecast. Then we have our historical and projected PNL or income statement. And lastly, our supporting schedules for working capital, depreciation, and capex. We covered all of this in an earlier module called Determining Assumptions and How to Derive the Financial Projections. And you can find more details on how we built this in that session. Over the next few sessions, we will focus solely on completing the DCF model. Before we begin, these are the following assumptions required for the DCF model. The first one is the valuation date. DCF approach values a business at a single point in time. So that is a specific day. The valuation date is the specific day that you want to value the company on. Valuation date is also known as measurement date or transaction date. If you are valuing a business for financial reporting purposes, the measurement date is usually the financial year end or some interim year, year end or some quarterly year end, some reporting date that you would need to take into account. And if you are valuing the business for the purpose of investment or M&A, then the valuation date is the transaction date or when the transaction or deal is closed. Next, we need to know the company's financial year end. We need to know the discount rate, which is the WAC in this case. You can refer to our earlier session where we show you how to derive the discount rate. Then we need the terminal growth rate, which is the perpetual growth rate. And we discussed this in detail in a previous session. Then we need the interest bearing debt, surplus cash, and surplus assets and liabilities. And if you remember from the previous sessions, there are certain adjustments that we need to make to convert enterprise value into equity value. And these are the items that are needed to make those adjustments. Now that we have that, the first thing we need to do when constructing the DCF model is to lay out the timeline. So let's create this section now. We'll give it a label, discounted cash flow. And the first thing you need to know is what is your valuation date? Because remember, the DCF is only concerned with future cash flows. So you're only concerned with cash flows after the valuation date, so cash flows that will come after 1 July 2020. So in this case, the first financial year end is 1 December 2020. The first period would be six months. So based on our valuation date and the first financial year end, let's extract the year using the year function from our financial year end. It would be 1 December 
2020. Subsequent financial year, year ends will be 2021. And we can just control R to copy that all the way through. Then we want to include the terminal year at the end of the forecast period. Let's do a bit of formatting to make this easier to read. Alt H P O to get a border underneath. Then we're going to fill out a date heading and a year fraction heading. Since our valuation date is in the middle of the year, we need to have a fraction of a year, so a partial year in this case. And let's start filling out the dates. I like to insert the valuation date here and make it a lighter color. And then we can insert the financial year end here. As you can see, the first financial period will be six months from 1 July 2020 to 31 December 2020. Next, I like to use a formula called EO month, where I can take this financial year end, add 12 months to get me the next financial year end, and then copy that through. Control R. Remember, the terminal value is not a year, so we just do this. As I mentioned, this is year fraction or partial year, and you're going to need this in most cases because most likely you will have partial years when you're doing your DCF model. So the formula is called year frac, and the start date would be the valuation date. Year end will be the first financial year end. Just put one. So that's half a year. You can copy that all the way through, control R, and that's that. So this is flexible because if we need to change the valuation date, say we change it to 1 March, and we change our year end to, say, October, these have automatically adjusted which makes it easier if we, have, if we have to make any changes later on. Let's go back and undo that. Next, we will calculate the free cash flows to the firm. So now that we have got the timeline set up for our DCF model, let's start building out the free cash flows to the firm. As you remember from the previous session, the starting point is EBIT. However, I like to copy in my entire PNL up to EBIT into my DCF model. So let's do that. Let's copy in our PNL into our DCF model. Bring in the expenses. And lastly, bring in EBIT. Let's format this so it looks nice. Okay. Before we bring in the numbers from our PNL, be careful or remember to adjust for the partial year or the year for the fraction of the year because we are only concerned with six months of cash flows in 2020. Whereas when we did the forecasts here, just make sure that in this case, we forecasted a full year. This is a full financial year. However, we are only concerned with six months of the year or half a year. So make sure that you account for this and we can do this by I suggest you lock this
So in this case, we are locking the row and we are allowing the columns each year to fluctuate. Multiply this by the first year of revenue. And you got that. This is half of this full financial year of revenue. And control R to copy that across. And then you can just control C, control V. And so you got that. We can do the same for salary and benefits. Lock that. Copy it over. And you can do the same through and control R. And lastly, we can do it the same for EBIT. Lock it. Make sure it's EBIT. And that's that. Let's format this to make it look good. We can add in some subtotal lines, fault HP3. Highlight this. Add in a subtotal line. And the same here. And we have that. As you remember, the starting point is EBIT. And we have correctly pulled that from our PNL or income statement, and we've made sure to adjust the partial year. Then we deduct taxes. And this would be the taxes we would pay if the firm were unlevered. So we ignore any interest and debt. And that's why we start with EBIT, because it's before interest, so interest is not being taken into account. Let's do that. And we have our tax rate, which is the effective tax rate, expected effective tax rate for the next few years. And we have our taxes. And that gives us EBIT 1 minus tax, which is, which is called net operating profit after tax, short for no tax. And as you can see, for expenses, I prefer to use net, uh, brackets, which is better for presentation purposes. And we have that. Then we add back all non-cash items. DNA being the main one. But there could be other non-cash items that could be added back as well, such as share-based payments, impairment charges, or unrealized losses. In our case, we just have depreciation and amortization today. And we can pick this up from here. And remember, this is being partialized for the year fraction. So that's fine. So we add that back. Next, we deduct capital expenditures, short for CAPEX. Depending on when CAPEX is spent, if all of this CAPEX was incurred in the second half of 2020, then all of this capex would fall into my DCF model. So it's important to understand when the capex is incurred. For simplicity's sake, in this case, I'm going to assume that capex is spent evenly throughout the year. So less capex times partial year. So we assume that half of the capex was spent for the valuation date in 2019 and half of the sorry 
half of the capex was spent before the valuation date in the first half of the year and the second half of the year we spent the remaining capex so 25000 in this case then we need to deduct any cash used for investment in networking capital when you invest in networking capital your networking capital increases so you are using cash to increase your networking capital so you deduct any increases in networking capital and on the flip side when there is a decrease in networking capital it means cash is being released from working capital back into your business so your cash balance is increasing so you will add back any decreases in networking capital so let's do that um, deduct the increase in networking capital so we go to our networking capital schedule and as we can see from 2019 to 2020 our networking capital has increased by 24,000 so we deduct any increases in networking capital because cash is being used and let's assume it's all done equally throughout the year. Don't forget your partial year. And you have that. And then finally, we arrive at unlevered free cash flows, which is known as free cash flows to the firm. Simple math. Which we start from no pat. And you sum it all the way down, get your unlevered cash flow or free cash flow to the firm, and simply copy that across Control R, and there you go. You have your free cash flows to the firm. You can add in some subtotals to format that nicely. Alt H B P. Alt H B P, and that's that. Next, we need to calculate the terminal value. But before we do that, we need to ensure that the last year of the projection, which is the terminal year, is normalized or stabilized. As mentioned in the previous session, the assumptions used in the terminal year are assumed to go on forever. So your terminal year free cash flow needs to be normalized and stabilized. And the way we do that is by normalizing and stabilizing the assumptions in the terminal year. And the main ones are the margins, the networking capital assumption, and the capex and depreciation. So let's look at this now. Our GP margin in the terminal year is 38%, which is higher than historical, but in line with our forecast. So it's fine. Our EBIT margin, again, is higher than the historical, which is concerning, but it's in line with the forecast. So business has been improved an expectation for the business to improve margins perhaps some economies of scale over the first few years of the forecast and it's acceptable had EBIT margin in the terminal year been 20 percent then it would be concerning to us and may not be supportable another way to sense check or cross check your terminal year EBIT margin is to look at the industry EBIT margin or the EBIT margins of the competitors or comparable companies of the target. Working capital assumption in the terminal year seems to be consistent with historical and you can sense check this with the industry or comparable companies. In terms of capex and depreciation, we prefer to look at the fixed asset turnover ratio. So what level of fixed assets does the business need to support its growth and its sales? Historically, it needed around 0 0.6, 0 
we expect over the forecast period a range of 0.8 to 0.89. So this makes sense. Just the point on terminal year capex. Since the business is matured and stabilized, we are concerned with more of a maintenance capex to maintain a slow growth of around 2% for the foreseeable future. Whereas, as you can see in the forecast period, this was probably some expansionary capex to help the business grow at breakneck paces of 20 15%. So this is definitely expansionary capex and then this is more for maintenance capex. A point on depreciation. In your terminal year, I want to stress that depreciation must be at least equal to capex or less than capex. Depreciation in your terminal year cannot be higher than your terminal year capex. Because if that's the case, what you are saying is that over the foreseeable future in the long term, you will depreciate faster than you will add assets into your business. And so at the end of the day, if your depreciation is greater than your terminal year capex, you, are, you will end up with no fixed assets in your business. So be sure to adjust these assumptions so that they make sense for the terminal year. So once you have that, you can go ahead and calculate your terminal value now that you're satisfied that the terminal year free cash flow is stabilized and normalized. Once we're satisfied with our terminal year free cash flow, we calculate the terminal value and we take the terminal year free cash flow times. If you remember, if you don't know the formula, you can check it out in our previous session, but it's one plus the terminal year growth rate, which is 2% in this case, the long-term GDP growth rate for the US. Let's put in our brackets. And we divide this entire thing by the WAC minus terminal year growth rate. And that's terminal value calculation. You can add a line to make that look nice. Next, we need to present value all of these amounts to arrive at enterprise value. Now, you could use the NPV function in Excel or the X. PV function in Excel. But I prefer to do it manually since doing it manually we can control the timing of the cash flows. Now what do we mean by timing of cash flows? I will explain here. So let's talk about timing of cash flows. If we use the NPV function in Excel we will assume all the cash flows are received at the end of the period and we present value it accordingly. But this is not logical in business because cash flows are received and paid throughout the entire year. This is a more logical representation of cash flows in a business earned throughout the year. So how do we configure our DCF to account for cash flows being earned throughout the entire year. And we do this by using a discount period, which uses a midpoint. And this assumes, by using a midpoint, so half 0 0.5, this assumes cash flows, all of these cash flows are earned evenly throughout the year, and it calculates the present value accordingly. Discounting by 0 0.5 is the same as discounting each month's cash flow. But remember, this assumes that cash flows are earned evenly throughout the year and that there's no seasonality in this business. So now I will show you how to calculate the discount period for each of the financial year ends. In year one, as we said, we determine the midpoint, which is half of a year, and we discount it by 0 0.5. The midpoint of the second year is here, which is 0 0.5 and then one. So that goes back 0 0.5, 1, so 1.5. The midpoint of year 3 is here, which is 0 0.5 plus 1 plus 1, which is 2.5. Let me show you another example. 
In this example, we have a partial year, so the valuation date is 31 March 2020, and the financial year end is 31 December 2020. So we have nine months from valuation date to year end, which gives us 0 0.75 is the year, the period is 0 0.75. And the midpoint of this year, 0 0.75 divided by 2 is 0 0.375. So the midpoint of this first period up until the year end is 0 0.375. And then in year 2, this is a full year, and the midpoint is here in the middle of the year. So from here to there is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.75, which gives us and the midpoint of year 3 is the middle of the year. So this would be the middle of the year all the way to the middle of year 2 is 1 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.75. And so you would discount this by 0 0.375. You would discount this by 0 0.5 plus 0 0.75 which gives you, and you would discount this by 1 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.75, which is maybe a bit overwhelming right now, but it's, I'll show you an example in the Excel file. So let's adjust the timing of our cash flows, and we do that by putting in the discount period and the discount factor. So, as mentioned, the first year is a partial year, which is a period of six months, and we want the midpoint, so we divide that by two, and we have the midpoint of the first period. We also want the midpoint of the second year, which would be this divided by two, but we also want to add back the full past period, partial year. And we have that. And then thereafter, all we got to do is just add in the full year period thereafter. And we can control R, and we have that. Remember, the terminal value is not a full year, so it will discount at the same period as the terminal year 2024. Next, we need to calculate the discount factor. But before we do that, let me show you, let me illustrate this visually to make it easier for you to understand. In our example, our valuation date is 1 July 2020. Year end is 31 December 2020. It's a six month period, which is half a year and gives us a midpoint of 0 0.25. The next year, which is year two, 31 December 2021, the midpoint or the middle of the year would be six months into the year, which would be 0 0.5. So if we want to discount this back, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it would give us 1. And year 3 would be the middle of the financial year and 31 December 2022. And so the midpoint would be 6 months into the year. So this would be 6 months, 6 months, so this would be 1 year. And then we come all the way back to present value to the valuation date, so it will be one year plus half plus half, which is two. And you would discount accordingly. So if we look at this, 0 0.25, 1 and 2, we can check this in our model. And here's our model. We had the 0 0.25, the 1, 2, and you just got to add 1 thereafter. Now to calculate the discount factor, it's basically using the standard present value formula, which is equal to 1 divided by 1 plus discount rate to the power of your discount period. And make sure to lock the WAC because it's going to pull through. You have that. Control R to copy it across. And that's that. And you calculate the present value of your free cash flow, so the firm and your terminal value 
you simply take your free cash flows times the discount factor, include your terminal value, and you have that. Do note that your terminal value is not a year on its own. The terminal value will be discounted at the same discount factor as your terminal year 2024. Just a point to note so you don't make the mistake. And let's put in a subtotal line to nicely format that. And then we just sum all of this to derive the enterprise value. We are not done yet. If you remember.